Uh, we want to thank the Lord once again. We want to give glory to God once again for giving us another chance to be able to be in his house and listen to his word. And uh, I believe that uh, we are going, continuing to be nourished. We appreciate the prayer that has been offered. I want to deal with uh, something that I believe is also important unto us right now. The experience of Isaiah and uh, the last day church. Yesterday we looked at uh, Zechariah chapter 3 and the experience of Yeshua and the people of the day in the day of atonement. Right now, I want us to look at uh, the experience of Isaiah in the last day church. And uh, I, I want us to look at the book of Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6. Book of Isaiah chapter 6. This is what we read. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train lived, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twine he covered his face, and with twine he covered his feet, and with twine he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so this is an experience. But uh, before we even enter into that experience and the glory that he saw and even asking, whom shall I send? This is one of those peculiar chapters in the Bible that appears out of blues, out of somewhere. We are not introduced to anything in Isaiah chapter 5 and then Isaiah chapter 7, but you just find Isaiah chapter 6 sandwiched between some history in Israel's existence. And so to get the context of uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and to know the story that is be happening behind the scene, uh, a king is introduced. In the year of that king, Uzziah did what? Died. How is Isaiah entering into the temple of God and seeing his glory connected with the death of King Uzziah? How is that even connected? We go to the book of uh, Second Kings chapter 15, 2 Kings chapter 15. No, no, everything is okay. I hope you have not interchanged. Have you changed the plug that was there? No, then. Uh... We continue. Uh, the, the, the book of Second Kings, chapter 15, from verse 1 to 7. We, we want to look at the context of Isaiah chapter 6 because Isaiah is talking about going into the temple of God and seeing him in his glory. And then he connects it with the death of King Uzziah. We want to know what is happening actually. Why King Uzziah is mentioned there and why is Isaiah being taken into the sanctuary of the Lord? And how is it connected to the end time events or the end time that you are living in? Second Kings chapter 15, verses 1. Are we there? Amen. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of where? 
Israel began to rule who? Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was who? Jechulia of Jerusalem. And he did what? That which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Verse 4, save that he did what? The high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham the king's son was over the house judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah. So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his father, fathers in the city of David, and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. But then you find that uh, in this story, uh, it says that all the deeds he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? And so more information of what was happening at that time, we find it in the book of Chronicles. And Second Chronicles chapter 26, Second Chronicles chapter 26, we are looking at the experience of Isaiah in connection with the last day church. But then we want to find what was happening at that time that made King Uzziah die and made the Lord lift Isaiah into his presence to see what was happening. Second Chronicles 26 verse 16, why did King Uzziah die and why did God summon Isaiah in his presence and how is it connected to us in such a time as this? Because we know that there is no one in the Bible which is wasted. Every word has it is significance when we read of it. Second Chronicle 26, 16. Are we there? Amen. But when his heart was done what? Lifted up to his, for he did what? Transgressed against the Lord, his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn what? Incense upon the altar of what? I want you to realize one thing. King Uzziah is going to burn incense in the sanctuary, but were the kings allowed to burn incense in the sanctuary? No, only the what? The priest. Continued on verse 17. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It pertaineth, appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the son of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast done what? Trespass, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Now there's a lot of things to unpack. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. Verse 20, and Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from then the year himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper into the day of his death and dwelt in a several being a leper for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. And that is what we find in Isaiah chapter 6. So Uzziah slept with his fathers as they buried him with his father in the field of the burial, which belonged to the kings. For they said he is a leper, and Jotham, his son, reigned his stead. And so this is the story of Uzziah and his rebellion and trying to do a work that he was not appointed to do, and that brought an end to him. But then we find in the same year that these things happen, 
Isaiah is brought in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because of the abominations that were happening in Israel and the, uh, uh, the, the, the usurping of um, the sphere that everyone had been put in. And as we look at the church of God today, there is a usurp of authority in the sanctuary of the Lord. And it will be one of the last, last acts in the drum before just the close of probation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so the people of God have to be lifted into the vision to see the abomination that are happening there and the things to be corrected. And so uh, the children of Israel were given the sanctuary to show forth the glory of God in the plan of redemption. But at this point, they had resorted to heathenism. And they needed a voice of reproof, even at such a time as this, when the sanctuary of the Lord has been desecrated and it is services steeped in abominations and things being done therein which should not be done. The people have to experience what Isaiah experienced in his days. And then the Lord may be able to touch them with the call from their altar so that they may be sent with the power of God to minister unto this uh, earth that is full of darkness. And so Isaiah prophesied in the time of Uzziah, as I have said, when there was a full, a blown apostasy in Israel. We understand by his rising against the prevalent uh, apostasies, he was sown asunder. Is it? Is it true? Was he killed for standing for the truth? While he tried to restore the true sanctuary services in Israel, he met his death. And not only meeting his death, that is when Israel went up in Babylonian captivity. And so uh, we are not to expect nothing less when we shall rise against the apostasies that are happening among us in such a time as this. But then I want you to look at this. Uh, in verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 6, he says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of what? Amen. I saw another angel come down, Revelation 18, with power, and the whole earth was filled with his glory. And so at that time, Isaiah saw the whole earth filled with the glory of God. But as he saw that, he was not ready to go and proclaim that glory. Read on in verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, what? Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then did what? Flee one of the seraphims unto me, having what? A live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, I have done what? Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin did what? Purged. Verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, What? Whom shall I send, and who will? Go for us, then said I, here am I, send me. So we have here apostasy happening. We have Isaiah 
who is unclean person living amongst unclean people, and the glory of the Lord should fill the whole the earth. No one is going to proclaim, and he has to be cleansed first before he goes to proclaim that glory. And the cleansing doesn't come from anywhere else, but the angel cleanses him with the call from where? The altar. And so we need a fresh cleansing from the altar to be able not only to behold the glory of the Lord, but to go all over the earth to proclaim the same glory. It, was, it will be only when we see this glory that we shall realize how fallen we are, and then we shall cry for the cleansing power to be also given the glory to go and proclaim the message. In Review and Herald, commenting on this chapter, RH February 18, 1896, paragraph 2. We want us to read some things and we we come to the parallels that are we are having at such a time as this. Uh, I want us to go to review and hear if uh, the writings will be big enough for us, it shall be well. So commenting on this chapter, In uh, the end, Herald, December 22, 1896. She says, Isaiah's experience represents last day what? Church. Are we together? As the prophet Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he was amazed and overwhelmed with a sense of his own weakness and what? unworthiness. Are we still together? He cried, Woe is me, for I am done what? And done because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah had done what? Denounced the sin of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. Is this the way we feel at such a time? We have been involved in denouncing the sins of others, but do we feel our own sins? A prophet whom Israel thought that was holy and acceptable before the Lord, now when he comes into conduct with God himself, he sees his own weaknesses in that the power that is to come down by that fourth angel to lighten the whole earth with the glory of God, when we shall behold that power, we shall abhor ourselves. It continues to say, he had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. And how had Israel come to a point of having a cold, lifeless worship because they had been led in apostasy by their kings and their kings were performing the sanctuary services instead of the priests at that time. Being in a place that you are not supposed to be. How little now appeared his wisdom and talents as he looked upon the sacredness and majesty of the watch, the sanctuary. We have never entered into the sanctuary to behold the brightness of God. That is why we do the things that we do even when we come to this church. The moment we shall step into the presence of God, we will even change how we behave when we come into the church of God. 
it is because we have never been in contact with that majesty. That is why we don't see the sinfulness of sin and we can afford the phones to ring when we come into the sanctuary. We are told how unworthy he was, how unfitted for sacred what? Service. And sometimes we pray, Lord, let me partake or be part of the loud crazy. But we never question our condition to be able to participate in it. His view of himself might be expressed in the language of the Apostle Paul, or oh, what? Wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. But relief was sent to Isaiah in his distress. The vision given to Isaiah represents what? The condition of God's people in what? Last days. Our work must be done. And we may be thinking that we have attained as Isaiah thought he had attained, but when we shall be brought into the contact of the glory of God in the heavenly sanctuary, we shall see that we are unfitted for the job, but yet relieve his sin. They are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward where? In the heavenly sanctuary. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. As they look by his by faith into the Holy of Holies and see the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, they perceive that they are a people of what? And clean lips. A people whose lips have often spoken vanity and whose talents have not been sanctified and employed to the glory of who? Of God. Well, may they despair as they contrast their own weakness and unworthiness with the purity and loveliness of the glorious character of Christ. But if they, like who? Isaiah will receive the impression the Lord designs shall be made upon the heart. If they will humble their souls before God, there is what? Hope for them. Amen. The bow of promise is above the throne. And the work done for Isaiah will be performed where? In them. God will respond the petitions coming from the contrite heart. Revealed Herald, December 22, 1896. And so if there is another chapter in the Bible that should be studied in connection with the sanctuary, it's the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Because we are told he experienced is the experience of the church in the end time when Christ is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. Isaiah had a wonderful view of God's glory. I don't know if I can increase this. Isaiah had a wonderful view of God's glory. He saw the manifestation of God's power. And after beholding his majesty, a message came to him to go and do a certain work. He felt wholly unworthy for the work. What made him esteem himself unworthy? Did he think himself unworthy before he had a view of God's glory? No. Sometimes we say, let that angel come down. But when it comes down, will we be able to face his glory? And we are told, no, he imagined himself in a righteous state before God. But when the glory of the Lord of hosts was revealed to him, when he beheld the inexpressible majesty of God, he said, I am done what? I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people, uh, of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto him, unto me, a living call in his hands which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Now together, this is the work that as individuals we need to have done for us. Are we together, the people of God? We want the word. 
the living call from off the altar placed upon what? Our lips. We want to hear the word spoke, spoken, the iniquities taken away and thy sin done what? We are told Christ himself was the Lord of the temple. When he should leave it, its glory will depart. That glory once visible in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat, where the high priest ended only once a year on the great day of atonement with the blood of the slain victim, typical of the blood of the Son of God shed for the sins of the world and sprinkled in it upon the altar. This was the Shekinah, the visible pavilion of Jehovah. It was this glory that was revealed to Isaiah when he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, his strength filled with the temple. So the glory that Isaiah came into conduct with was the glory that shall be seen when Christ comes, when the probation has closed. Now we are told when he comes with that glory, it will be with the glory of the Father and the angels. The glory that shall consume the man of sin, while the same glory shall save the people of God who have accepted him. And so Isaiah did not see the glory of God before the probation was closed, but after probation was closed. And that is why it was so majestic that he said, if this is the glory that the people will come in contact with when probation closed, woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Are we together? What if we will have that glory, a glimpse of it? Sometimes a representations are made of how the Son of God will come with that glory to take uh, his children home while he destroys sin. But even the artist impression of that glory cannot perfectly represent that glory when it shall be revealed. The only thing we can pray at a, such a time as this is that the Lord may work on our hearts so that when that glory comes, we may not be amazed by it and be consumed by it. We continue to read about this story of uh, Isaiah and Uzziah. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah was permitted in vision to look into the holy place and into the holy of holies in the heavenly sanctuary. The curtains of innermost sanctuary were drawn aside and a throne high and lifted up, towering as it were to the very heavens, was revealed to his gaze. An indescribable glory emanated from a personage on the throne and his train filled the temple as his glory will finally fill the earth. Cherubim were on either side of the mercy seat as guards round the great king and they glowed with the glory that enshrouded them from the presence of God. As their songs of praise resounded in deep, earnest notes of adoration, the pillars of the gate trembled as if shaken by what? An earthquake. And we understand this glory shall start to be revealed between the sixth and the seventh plague. Now that one, we can study it. This holy being sang forth the praise and glory of God with lips and polluted with what? Sin. And the only people who shall sing the song are the people who have an experience that Isaiah had, the experience of overcoming sin. We see them with the harp standing with the lamb on Mount Zion and singing that song of experience that none other can sing. And so we need to be having an experience right now that will help us even sing that song. The contrast between the feeble praise, which he had been accustomed to, to bestow upon the creator and the fervid praises of the seraphim astonished and humiliated the prophet. Have we been able to ever think if angels came in our presence to praise uh, uh, with us together with the Father, that even our praises will be acceptable unto the Lord? Or we are a people still with unclean lips, not even seeking to be purified, to be able to give praises that are acceptable before God. 
We are told he had for the time being the sublime privilege of appreciating the spotless purity of Jehovah's exalted character. While he listened to the song of the angels as they cried, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory, the glory, the infinite power, and the unsurpassed majesty of the Lord passed before his vision and was impressed upon his soul. We are told, in the light of this matchless radiance that made manifest all he could bear in the revelation of the divine character, his own inward defilement stood out before him with startling what? Clearness. His very words seemed vile to him. Brothers and sisters, have we had an experience in the Lord, whether in praises, whether in prayers, that even we felt that our words were vile themselves while we were even praying to the Lord. We have an experience of the Lord in his sanctuary doing a most solemn work. We are told that the experience of Isaiah is the experience of the church in the last days. Have we reached this experience? Yet, we can say that the world is coming to an end but we haven't had the experience to take us through these last days. Thus, when the servant of God is permitted to behold the glory of the God of heaven, as he is unveiled to humanity and realizes to a slight degree the purity of the Holy One of Israel, he will do what? He will make startling confessions of the pollutions of his soul rather than proud boasts of his word holiness. Sometimes we go around saying, I have overcome this and I have overcome this. The time that we will have an experience with the Lord, we shall see how our holiness we have been proud of is nothing. We are told, in deep humiliation, Isaiah exclaimed, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. We are told this is not the, that voluntary humility and servile self reproach that so many seem to consider it's a virtue to display. This vague mockery of humility is prompted by hearts full of pride and what? Self esteem. There are many who demerit themselves in words who will be disappointed if this cause did not call forth expressions of praise and appreciation from others. What does that mean? We, we try to be humble in the presence of the people, be having that humility. But the reason we are trying to be humble before the people and exhibit humility is so that somebody may say, oh, that brother and sister is so humble. Is it not so? And we are told it is nothing less but pride and selfishness. Because the praise is not going to God, but it's going to you. Continued on. But the conviction of the prophet was genuine. As humanity with its weakness and deformity was brought out in contrast with the perfection of divine holiness and light and glory, he felt altogether inefficient and unworthy. How could he go and speak to the people, the holy requirements of Jehovah who was high and lifted up and whose train filled the temple? Right now, we are talking about the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18, doing what? What is the theme? Going to finish the work in unity, is it? But then we are told, when we shall see the glory of God, we shall even ask ourselves, how can I go to the people when I am in such and such a state? We are ready, and if we were told today that now go, if we, have, we were seated right here, or we were standing there, and the angel, the literal angel was revealed in the skies of heaven and told you it's a time for loud cry, go forth and proclaim the word of God. 
how many will say this is the time that we have been waiting for and now we are to go? I can say I'll be one of them, but have I checked my condition to go? Right now, are we not waiting to go? Are we ready to go? And so while Isaiah was trembling and conscience smitten because of his impurity in the presence of his unsurpassed glory, he said, then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. As we try to bring this to a close, we are told, Continued on in Review and Herald, December 22, 1896. You can read the whole uh, 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 month of that uh, newsletter. The seraphim before the throne are so filled with reverential awe in beholding the glory of God that they do not for an instant look upon themselves with self-complacency or in admiration of themselves or one another. But yet we still praise each other and desire each other and say how this is holy and this one is walking humbly and all that. The angels never tried that. As they see the glory of God, they can never praise each other or look at each other with admiration. Their praise and glory are for the Lord's host who is high and lifted up and the glory of whose strength fills the temple. As they see the future, when the whole earth shall be filled with his glory, the triumphant song of praise is echoed from one to another in melodious chant. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the host. They are fully satisfied to glorify God. And in his presence, beneath his smile of approbation, they wish for nothing more. In bearing his image, in doing his service and worshiping him, their highest ambition is fully reached. And so what we should be striving, as Isaiah was striving, is to have the image of God. In the beginning, God created man in his likeness and in his image. And what we should be striving for right now is just to have that image and not to bring the praises unto ourselves, but to give praise unto the Lord. Let what? Every soul who claims to be a son or daughter of God, examine himself in the light of what? Heaven. Let him consider the polluted lips that make him undone. Now, friends, there are so many things that are making us undone. You look at this and it just make you undone. You look at that, be it our jobs, be it our families. There is nothing that is pleasing at the current times that we are living in. Our educational lines, our health system, all these things have made us undone. But while we are still looking at these things and even realize that they are making us undone, we are not ready to let them go. That is the most startling thing. We can count, oh, I'm in a false education. I'm in a false system of uh, economic system. I'm in a false health system and I'm in a false job. And we say, I'm undone. But after saying I'm undone, we go back and do those things that makes us undone. How shall it be with us? And we are told this representation of Isaiah and him saying, I'm undone, is the experience of God's people in the last days. And Isaiah says, how can I go in a, such a state when I'm undone? And the Lord has to touch him with the call. And that call is a call of purification so that he may come from his state of undone to be in a state where he is complete and is ready to go. They are the medium of communication. 
Then let them not be used in bringing from the treasure of the heart words that will dishonor God and discourage those around you, but use them for the praise and glory of God who has formed them for his purpose. When the cleansing call is applied from the glowing altar, the conscience will be purged from dead works to serve the what? The living God. And when the love of Jesus is the theme of contemplation, the words coming from human lips will be full of praise and thanksgiving to God and to the Lamb. How many words are spoken in lightness and foolishness, in jesting and joking? This will not be so did the followers of Christ realize the truth of the words. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And so... Isaiah had a message from the God of heaven to give the backsliding people of Israel. Do we have a message for the backsliding Israel? We have a message, is it? And he gave them this message. He knew what elements he had to deal with. He knew the stubbornness and perversity of the heart and how hard it would be to make any impression upon them. As he stood in the portico of the temple, the Lord revealed himself to him. Where was Isaiah? In the portico of the temple. Is it? And the priests on the day of atonement, they were to be found in the portico of the temple while the high priest was in the most holy place. And what were they praying for? Spare thy people, O God. You can read that in Joel chapter 2. And we can they go there very quick and see what they were doing at the portico in the book of Joel chapter 2. Book of Joel chapter 2. Now, how can we be priests in the portico when we are a people of unclean lips? The book of Joel chapter 2. Something interesting about this part of the sanctuary. Joel chapter 2 from verse 12. Are we there? Amen. Therefore also now say the Lord turn ye even to me with all your what? Your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with what? And rend what? Your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Verse 14, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Verse 15, together do what? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call what? Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble what? The elders gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let who? The priest that ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, that is the portico, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? And so the Lord is needing a people like Isaiah who shall stand between the porch and the altar, the porch and the altar and Christ spare thy people. But the priests could not weep, spare thy people when they had still unclean lips. And that is why Isaiah had to be cleansed before he could tell the Lord, spare thy people. So, as he stood in the portico of the temple, the Lord revealed himself to him. The veil of the temple was withdrawn, the door lifted up, and he had a view of the Holy of Holies within the veil. He saw the God of Israel before the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple. As Isaiah sends his own sinfulness, he cries out, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. And there was seen the hand that took the live coal from off the altar and touched his lips and made him be clean. Now, look at the words in uh, bold. Then he was how? Ready to go with? The message, and he said, do what? 
sent me, for he knew that the Spirit of God will be with the world. And that is the power we need in Revelation chapter 18 to accompany the message. For those who are engaged in the work of God in the world, conversions of soul, it will seem as though it was impossible to reach the obdurate heart. This is how Isaiah felt, but when he saw that there was a God above the cherubim and that they were ready to work with God, he was ready to carry the message. We are told angels shall be in our midst to carry forth the work. The live call is symbolical of what? Purification. If he touches the lips, no impure one will fall from them. The live call also symbolizes the potency of the efforts of the servants of the Lord. God hates all coldness, all commonness, all cheap efforts. Those who labor acceptably in his cause must be men who pray fervently. Those who labor acceptably in his cause must be men who pray fervently and whose works are wrought in God, and they will never have cause to be ashamed of their record. They will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, and their reward will be given them, even eternal life. Now, allow me for 10 minutes to speak about something. There are things which are happening among us that need the power of God, but we cannot go to face them if Christ is not with us. This I have presented before, but I want just to touch them as we end this. The church in Netherlands commits itself to being a safe haven place for what? LGBTI what? Individuals. These are abominations that are happening in the church as we speak right now. And we need a power beyond normal power to go and be able to talk about these things. Now, this is one of the things that uh, have been coming in in the last few years. But now it seems we are coming to an end of them. All persons, including practicing homosexual, should be made to feel welcome to attend our churches, while non-practicing gay persons should be welcome into, me into membership and church office. Now you have to understand something that we are at the end of the times. Practicing ones should be welcome to our churches. But whoever feels they are gay, but they are not practicing, should be welcomed into church what? Offices. Are we together, brethren? You have to understand that we are not at the beginning of the times, that we are at the end of the times. When homosexuality knocked at the remnant in the days of Lord, that was the end of the earth that time. When we are seeing homosexuality knocking at the doors of Adventism, we should understand this is the time for the loud cry. Lord had to announce to his sons that this is the end of the matter and they have to come out of that area. And as we see this happening, we should understand this is the time to come out of Babylon and these fallen churches to proclaim the loud cry. But how shall we go with unclean lips and without the power to proclaim the message? And how is this even related in the times of Isaiah? When they are coming in the church offices, it means people are getting into the sanctuary to do a work that they have not been fitted to do, as even King Uzziah did this, and then Isaiah was taken in the presence of the Lord. So we are seeing some Uzziahs in our days, people who are involved in the things that they should not be get involved and in yet going to minister on the altar of God. We are told 
gay and lesbian members who choose to earn and remain abstinent should be given the opportunity to participate in all church activities, including leadership positions in the church. Why can't we give a drunkard a position in the church then? How special is a lesbian that he has to be accommodated to take an office and a drunkard is not accepted? We should understand what we are dealing with. And the devil in full force has invaded Seventh-day Adventism and even closed the eyes of the reformers, they can palliate with these things. We are told we strongly affirm that homosexual persons have a place in the Seventh-day Adventist. So I say adulterers have a place in Seventh-day Adventists. God forbid. Why should we be denouncing sin? Because we have been used to sin. As a consequence of Seventh-day Adventist unwillingness to change with the times, many gay Adventists have felt what? Unwelcome. So we need to change with the times, not change with the Bible. While the December 19th appearance of the Palm Spring Gay Men's Chorus at our Palm Spring Adventist Church did not abrogate Adventist doctrine respecting homosexuality, it did in fact mark a very significant step in welcoming members of the LGBT community. Now, the world is crying for the LGBTQ to have its right, and you find Adventists also are crying that they should have their right. Where are we in the streams of time? We are in the days of Lord, when just the three angels are coming, one of them being the son of God, and then Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. And yet we can still say we are waiting for the loud cry. Which loud cry are we waiting? We can only say we are waiting for the loud cry because we have not received the latter rain. And the reason we haven't received it is because we still entertain sin. We are a people of unclean lips. Transgender is the elder. These women of the nation and women elders in office and pastors. And we are not talking about gifts. We are talking about offices. A wrong person was ministering incense in the sanctuary of the Lord, Uzziah. And right now we dare take women to offer incense in the sanctuary of the Lord and still think that we are headed in the right way. It is very obvious that this is a loving church. We have become a loving church and not a people of the book. Thou shalt love your neighbor as you love yourself. We have become so loving. We have gone beyond the love of Philadelphia. And when you go beyond Philadelphia, you become a Laodicea. There is no other love beyond Philadelphia. This is a church that does not care about your religious beliefs. All things, those things don't matter. Now, who are people promoting these things? People with MDs, divinity, professors, in theological studies. Jesus had two fathers who affirmed the LGP lifestyle. He had Joseph and he had the God the Father. I'm talking people who have degrees and professors and they are being paid tight by you if you are still in GC. So you continue going to GC where actually the father, the Jesus Christ had two fathers and then we are family LGBT. We have to realize what we are doing. Either the man is going to finish the work of Satan or to finish the work of God. Heterosexuality is only ideal. Homosexuality is the reality because of Romans 3.23. Now, what is Romans 3.23? For all have fallen and for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So uh, actually homosexuality is acceptable because all have fallen. These are not coming from the lips of the fallen churches. These are coming from the lips of the remnant who should be standing for the truth. 
Now, if you read Revelation chapter 18, and I know I'm about to enter into the time of Brother Anthony, but allow me to read something about Revelation chapter 18 again. I hope we are not tired, is it? Let us, uh, let us read this. Complete what? The command found where? In Revelation 18 verse, come out of her, my people, means to come out of those institutions which will place in the minds of what? Our young people, principles, which are up to make them join the class of worshippers of which we read in what? 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of boldness but denying the power thereof. As faithful watchmen, we should be just as desirous of getting our, our children out of popular schools as we are to call the older people out of the popular churches. And we are a one-sided church. We are ready to call the people out of those popular churches, but we are not ready to call our children from those popular schools. Read on. The popular churches are only a product of world education. So to get at the root of the matter, we must separate ourselves from that which creates the condition in which all the religious world at present finds. So from the popular churches, they get the popular education which affect the condition of the church. As they go to those seminaries conducted by Catholics, they come there with the ideas that homosexuality is not the ideal, it's only the ideal, but his heterosexuality is the, uh, I think heterosexuality is the ideal, but uh, heterosexuality, the homosexuality is uh, the reality. And so lastly, firstly, we, we, we must understand where we are right now. Uh, This is what I was telling you yesterday by Jonathan Paul and PhD professor of religion, theological studies. Okay. The Bible does not address the LGBT lifestyle. Paul knew nothing about our sexual orientation today because he lived in a different era. Leviticus 18.22 and Romans 1.26 to 28 must be studied more because they are not as conclusive as they appear to be on the surface. The Bible cannot settle every question. Let us go to Leviticus 18.22. We need prayers more than we ever pray. I'll read Leviticus 18.22. Read the last slide, then we pray. We have to feel the experience of Isaiah today. 18.22, quickly, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind it is what? I don't need two verses to know that this is homosexuality. Last slide. What should I do if I am a gay Seventh-day Adventist? Answer, here are seven options. Mr. Larson stated that only he agrees with the last two options. Bear in mind there are seven options if you are a gay Seventh-day Adventist and his option are the last two. One, commit what? That is not an option. He says don't commit suicide. Two, stay in the closet. He says don't stay in the closet. Marry a person of the opposite sex. Seek change therapy by praying, reading the Bible and counseling and getting counseling. Engage in promiscuity. Number six, which he approves is celibacy. And number seven, form a loving, lasting union akin to marriage. We understand there are two institutions that God made, the Sabbath and the what? We are seeing marriage is down. What is next? The Sabbath. May the Lord bless us.
our Heavenly Father, we are unclean people living among us unclean people also. We are a people of unclean lips. Woe unto us, how we pray today that we may have an experience of Isaiah. While there be many abominations that happen in thy sanctuary, you need a people who will sigh and cry and receive the seal of God and receive the latter rain to proclaim the message of Revelation 18. Here we are in this day of prayer and fasting. Lord, not because we can endure hunger, but because we need your presence. And so we are praying that if there is anything you can do for us today, is to cleanse us and equip us with the power of the angel of Revelation 18, that we may renounce ourselves, that we may be able to do a work that no other generation has been called to do. Bless your children as they contemplate upon these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.